Okay, part two here. Let's take a look at acid rain, also called acid deposition or acid precipitation. Here we see a forest that has trees that are dying or suffering from acid rain in the mountains of North Carolina. You can see that many of these tree stumps are dead or have sparse vegetation. So what's the process behind this? Well, it starts with mostly coal burning electric power plants. So you see the, the exhaust coming from the power plants from the smokestack. When you burn coal, it releases sulfur dioxide and also some nitric oxide, NO. And in the air, these two chemicals, which can be called primary pollutants, react with water and oxygen and oxidants to form secondary pollutants, sulfuric acid and nitric acid. When the rain comes down, it has now been acidified by the presence of these acids. And the pH we're talking about is anywhere from like 4 to 6. Remember, pH of 7 is neutral. And the key thing here, a couple things. One is, oftentimes where it's a problem, where the precipitation is falling, is many miles from where the pollution was formed. And keep in mind, too, that um, the higher up we can make the exhaust go, then the more easily it will be able to get into the upper wind and be distributed away from the city, um, but still causing the major problems over away from the city. So taller smokestacks can be a benefit for this. So specifically, acid deposition means the deposition of acidic or acid-forming pollutants from the atmosphere onto the earth as acid rain could be acid fog, acid snow, etc. It's caused by the reaction of primary pollutants like SO2 and NO with water, oxygen, and oxidants, resulting in secondary pollutants, sulfuric acid or nitric acid. And they can have wide-ranging and detrimental effects on ecosystems and buildings and statues. So here we see an effect on the building where acid rain is eaten away at this, um, at her face, basically. Where did her nose go? And many cities are having to restore some of their statues, um, recasting some, patching up some. Ecosystem effects are pretty severe. You know, here's a pretty extensive list. You should know at least two of these and why they occur. And you can ask in class for further explanation. But um, one of the big things is to remember, the key point here is that acids are good at dissolving things. So that means they can dissolve rock minerals, and now those minerals can flow in the water in the acid rain that dissolved them. So this can cause an increase, for example, of, um, of aluminum, aluminum levels in surface water. So you can see here, many lakes that are suffering from acid rain will show increased levels of aluminum. And that can be bad because this aluminum for one, it can kill fish. And if you see up here, it can also hinder the uptake of water and nutrients by, um, by plants in the water or near the water. All right, so what's another problem with it? Uh, I'll give you another example that soil, good soil, has important minerals that plants need. When acid rain falls, it can dissolve and carry away those minerals. So it's, it can do a really um, good job in a bad way of leaching important important ions from soil. So here we see that accelerated leaching of base cations. You can think of it as just base um, minerals that the soil, um, that's good for the soil to have. And um, because some of these minerals are getting dissolved away from the acid rain, something else that can happen is a loss in the ability for that water or that soil to neutralize further acids that come along. And there's a concept in chemistry called buffers, and buffers are minerals or dissolved minerals that can resist the change in pH when you add an acid. And um, anyways, when you wash away those minerals, you reduce the soil's ability to protect itself from further acid rain. And, you know, the end result of this is we have reduced species diversity and abundance of aquatic life, and this can affect negatively entire food webs. Okay, so let's go on to some other ideas with acid rain. The acidity varies geographically. 
And what is the pH range for acid rain? You know, we're talking not super acidic. You're not going to like feel a burning from acid rain unless maybe you got some in your eyes or in your nose. But pH of lower than 4.3 would be really bad acid rain. pH greater than 5.3 would be not so bad. Um, and of course, pH of 7 is neutral. Um, all rainwater is slightly acidic because as it's falling, it can pick up carbon dioxide from the air. And so you get a little bit of carbonic acid acidifying it. Like we talked about when CO2 gets dissolved into ocean water, it also um, slightly acidifies the oceans. But we can see here, we don't really have this problem in the west where the pHs are all pretty high. Whereas you go back east and you get a major problem here. So why is that? Well, for one thing, we don't really use coal, especially not here in California. Coal is burned in many parts of the country, especially in the area we call Appala Appalachia, along the Appalachian Mountains, where there's awesome, um, extensive coal deposits. And so we burn the coal to produce steam in an electric power plant, and that steam can be used to turn the electric generators to make the electricity. But here in, the, in California, at least, we use a lot more natural gas natural gas that we often pipe up from Mexico. And that's much cleaner burning. doesn't produce the pH because it doesn't produce the sulfur that's going into the air or the nitrates for that matter. Um, and where in the Pittsburgh PA area would this problem be greatest? You know, Pittsburgh PA is right here in central Pennsylvania. And I'm bringing this, I'm asking this question now because um, in this, in our country, winds generally blow to the east, from west to east. And so if you were living just east of the city where this, um, where this power plant existed, then you'd be more affected by acid rain falling on you. Let's take a look at some anti-pollution laws and technology, some of which relate to acid rain. So first, acid deposition reduction. Well, following the 1970 Clean Air Act, there were some great improvements. Sulfur emissions have decreased due to Number one, technology, especially what we call scrubbers to clean smokestack emissions. And also legislation and a market-based emissions trading scheme called cap and trade. And that came around that came around more recently, around 1990s. However, nitrate pollution has risen slightly and acidification is not being reversed as many had hoped. We are still having the problem of acid rain, it hasn't gone away. Uh, we can see here some data from New Hampshire's Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest, where acid rain was first studied. pH has increased, meaning rain has become less acidic since the Clean Air Act, but is still much more acidic than normal rain. So let's focus again on that legislation. Two major ones here. The Clean Air Act of 1970, which set stricter standards than previous laws. It imposed emissions limits, how much a factory can emit. Um, in a day or in a year, and provided research funds to improve um, to improve to improve smokestack technology or emissions technology, and it enables citizens to sue violating parties, giving power to people against companies that are polluting. And then in 1990, there was a Clean Air Act, um, uh, I guess you could say Part Two, which strengthened previous regulations and it introduced emissions trading, which we call cap and trade for sulfur dioxide. And this means, this idea of cap and trade, means companies must buy permits that are good for an allowable amount of pollution. If they pollute less, they can sell unused permits to other country, uh, other companies. Let's take a look at some of the technology to clean up um, emissions. So one is called smokestack scrubbers. And this is to reduce SO2 emissions from coal plants by spraying water through the smoke. This water then reacts with crushed limestone rock to bind the sulfur into a solid mineral form. So here comes our pollutants containing carbon dioxide, um, calcium oxide, sulfur, and, uh, sulfur oxides. And um, so uh, it comes through here, and then we have this unreacted sulfur dioxide, which we don't want to emit, goes through, scrubbers the water, um, shoots it, and it becomes a calcium sulfate slurry, which then you can put in the ground um, and uh, keep that sulfur in mineral form, not in the air. Uh, so actually, uh, this calcium oxide here is injected to cause it to react here. And um, 
Yeah, and then becomes a slurry here. So what does it look like from the outside? It looks kind of like this. Here's our smokestack scrubbers. And um, that would be cleaning it before it goes off into the um, smokestack. Okay, let's take a look at electrostatic precipitators, a different kind of technology. These are designed to reduce particulate matter in the smoke using electrostatic attraction to pull the particulates out as they pass. So you have flue gla gas entry. This is the gas coming from combustion. It goes between these plates that are charged. You have positive on one, negative on the other. And so because you now have an electric field between those plates, these particles as they're coming through will get attracted to one of the plates. And um, when it hits a plate, it might get kind of stuck. Then you have these, this vibrating mechanism that will shake down the, the ash into a tunnel. And then the fly ash goes to some storage silo that you can then take into a landfill or something. And then the gas coming out is nice and clean. What do these look like from the outside? Kind of like this. So um, you can see down here is where the fly ash would be collected. And then you could drive a truck underneath that and pick it up and drive it off. So that's a really good way to get rid of particulates. And here's another big technology that's come out of the Clean Air Act, catalytic converters. Um, all of your cars have catalytic converters. And these, these reduce carbon monoxide and VOCs by allowing further combustion in the tailpipe. They convert CO to CO2 and VOCs to CO2 and H2O. So VOCs would be like unburned fuel or maybe if your car burns oil, it would be oil that's, um, that's gone through the engine and out your tailpipe. So CO2 and H2O are the two products of burning any kind of um, any kind of uh, burnable material, wood, fuel, whatever. So on a car, uh, you would see it, it look kind of like this. Uh, my car doesn't look quite that nice and shiny, but perhaps yours does. Okay, so at the end of your notes, I'd like you to write a summary of the main concepts presented in part one and part two, and then finish up assignment 8.2. All right, 